podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Okay, welcome to Drinking with Authors, the podcast. I'm your host, Erica Lance, and with me today is... J.M. Piquette. And our guest today is the amazing Sarah Carlson. Woo! <laughs> Hi! The producers figured out how to put a cheer track in, so... <laughs> so we do it ourselves? Believe it or not. You don't hear it, but they're <laughs> Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we're drinking. I am drinking um, apple cider with uh, misunderstood ginger whiskey in it from our Drinking with Authors cup. Um, what are you drinking, Jen? I am drinking coffee in my Drinking with Authors cup, but it's banana foster flavored coffee, so there's that. <laughs> All right, mine's the boring one. It's early here, so I am drinking coffee out of a mug. It's mm-hmm. just black drip coffee <laughs> we will get you a drink with author's cup after this so. that would be amazing so i have a uh, wine for later once we uh <laughs> once we're talking for a bit oh cool i love that okay so sarah for our audience will you um talk a little bit about what kind of writer you are yes yeah, so i'm a nonfiction writer and um my first book is called in the dark of war and it's a uh, true account of the evacuation from Libya. So I was in Libya shortly after the Benghazi attacks, which I think probably most people in the world are familiar with. Um, That was in 2012, September 2012. So I got there in July of 2013, and the situation continued to devolve, and then we ultimately had to evacuate. And I suppose a key part of that information is that I'm a former CIA officer, so I was the CIA analyst in Libya. So it's about so you that weren't account. just vacationing there when all this. <laughs> no, <laughs> key piece of information. <laughs> it is key. So obviously, very lighthearted piece of work. No seriousness. No. Lots of laughs. Lots of intensity. Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, It was quite intense, and so I tried to write it to reflect that. So um, it definitely builds throughout the book, as it did throughout the year, um, and then ultimately culminating with this sort of harrowing overland evacuation. I actually wrote it, so it goes back and forth in the narrative between the um, evacuation and then what was happening throughout the year. Um, I thought sort of what was happening throughout the year might get a little um, boring, to be honest. Um, as it slowly (laughs) builds, right? Um, Because it didn't start out with like all the intensity it it built throughout the year. So um, I alternated the narrative just to keep a little more interesting. So what made you decide to, um, well, first of all, this is your first book that you published, correct? Yes, and I'm working on more. So um, I am working on more nonfiction and then also fiction, so spy novels. Um, so very much in keeping with the theme and, um, you know, I've always been fascinated by like survival stories and, um, you know, the, um, like crisis management side of things. So I'm actually in emergency management now. And so the other nonfiction books I'm working on are more related to like preparedness and survival and that kind of thing. And then the, even the spy novels kind of keep that theme going too. And the nonfiction one, ultimately, it's about surviving Libya, so it's very much still along the theme. No, totally. What made you decide that you wanted to write? Like, you you were a CIA agent, so first of all, it's very, very you know, Bond, James Bond in a literary sense. So you're a CIA agent, and then you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write books. What was the transition? How do you go from one to the next? Right. So I will say my uh, career trajectory has been nothing normal. Um, I actually majored in English. So my degree from college is in writing. And um, I'm a PhD in English lit. So she's like, yay, high five. I would strongly recommend it to anyone. So I went to the University of Puget Sound and I got my degree in English writing and, um, absolutely love writing. I've always done it. And in fact, even in the CIA, it was so useful to have that kind of degree. Like I know like most people go in with like masters in like foreign policy or international relations or something like that. Um, but I will say that degree helped me so much because 
the bulk of what we were doing was writing. So to go in with a really strong background in writing already, I think that really helped. It was able to like turn around assessments and products and things like that really fast. Um, and that was a big part of my job. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit. Um, so the, the reason we met is through a friend of mine who was also former CIA. I know all the spies. No, I don't. Just <laughs> you watching this. You know, I didn't know the now. spies. You know, any- so my dear friend, Rosa, she actually bought me this picture. Um, <laughs> it was very thematic too, so I, I put it up. Um, yeah, no, Rosa and I worked together at CIA and um, she she's my phone a friend. When I need help, she's the one I call. Yes, she is. A, uh, she's amazing. But she talked to me a little bit about your publishing experience because you've had oh a little gosh. bit of an interesting publishing experience. By interesting, I think you mean nightmare. <laughs> well, I was going to say tragedy, but I thought I would leave that to the to the listening audience. To okay. So uh, I first submitted the book to CIA in October of 2015. So as a CIA officer, we sign a secrecy agreement saying that anything we write, we will run through their review board before publication. So um, it's a legal document. If you don't do it, you can be sued and they can take all your profits. So um, even besides that, besides not wanting to get sued by the CIA, um, you know, that's the integrity issue too. Like I sign this thing and so I'm going to follow through on doing it. Um, some people don't, and there've been a couple recent examples and so far nothing has happened, but you know, it's sort of the looming over them that they could be sued and all their money taken. So anyway, that's a little separate tangent, but I submitted mine in October of 2015. We're very famous for tangents on this show. It's so- <laughs> well, it's so frustrating because I mean, I'll get to the end and you'll realize everything I had to go through. And then there's these other people that are like, oh, well, I didn't want to wait. So I just go ahead and publish. Like, well, wait until you- they make some money and then CIA shows up and takes out all of their coolness. So, so- <laughs> the rules okay. sometimes are meant to be followed. Yes. Oh. Well, in this one, you know, like if you, if you don't, it literally could result in people's lives. So, you know, that's a really big deal. And it's not up to me to decide what I think is classified. It's up to the CIA. And so, um, you know, you just don't know how something that seems like totally innocuous to you, like could actually end up being a really big deal in an operation or something else. So yeah, I, I definitely followed that requirement. The problem is, so I got it approved. It took about a year and a half. It took quite a long time for them to do it. At the time they were telling people it was going to be up about 30 days. Um, so like, you know, end of November, 2015, I'm like checking my email every day. Little did I know I wouldn't hear back <laughs> for another year. Um, so they did actually clear it. And then I sent it to a couple of readers and they made some suggestions. So anytime you change it, then you have to send it back. So I ended up sending it back to them, got it approved. And so then I was able to start submitting it to literary agents, um, to try to find a publisher. So, um, found my agent, signed with him. I had avoided um, sort of mentioning the Benghazi attacks at all costs in my book. And he asked me to add in more about the attacks and more about like my childhood and stuff like that. Um, So I did. And then because I changed it, I had to send it back again. So this is the third time. (laughs) That time when I sent it back, they decided the entire thing and every version of it that I had ever submitted was classified. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Wow. in its entirety. They did, they did what I like to call a takey back seat, which is a formalized term of taking something back. Right, which is also not allowed. <laughs> They're not allowed to do that. Um, but at that point, you know, I had sent it to many literary agents while I was searching for, you know, I'm sure your listeners are familiar with that process of like going on submission and all that. So I um, had sent it out, and so I asked some of my former CIA colleagues that had um, also published books, like, what do, what do I do? You know, I was really worried because I had already sent it. So they put me in touch with a lawyer, um, Mark Zaid, who sort of specializes in representing um, former CIA officers, and um, he recommended submitting a lawsuit, which he did, um, and pretty soon after he submitted it, they reversed their decision again in full. So, um, so they allowed me to right now that there is a, a, 
attorney out there that had to specialize in helping ex-CIA, that that had to become a specialization wow. of a person. Like, think about that. Like, that's not, like a niche. Like, it's a super... <laughs> Super little niche, yet somebody you found specialized in. So he does, um, I think, all intelligence community, and then he also represents um, like whistleblowers from the administration and whatnot. So, um, yeah, oh, he's quite good. I strongly recommend him to anyone um, in the intelligence world who might need it. Um, yeah, so it was just it was a really long process to get that approved, and um, it ended up being, you know, like last year and then um, got a publisher and then um, set the publishing date. And then of course, coronavirus. So then ultimately after five years of working on it, ended up coming out in the middle of a pandemic. Well, but it's know, out. I will say, I, you know, talking to, we get to talk to a lot of authors all the time. And um, because we have a show that does that, I suppose that's, I know, weird. <laughs> weird. weird that we do that. But, um, you know, this pandemic, we have a lot of authors that, for instance, even Jonathan Mayberry, M.K. Williams, they wrote these books about a pandemic happening way before the pandemic happened. And then they were set, it was like cosmic fate. They were set for now to release in the middle of the pandemic. Like M.K. Williams pushed hers off. Jonathan Mayberry can't because he's like set in stone on his things. And there's these giant pandemic novels coming out in the middle of a pandemic. And it's like, people are like, this is poor taste. And you're like, yeah, there's it's just the timing. Right. So them. like the date was set, you know, a year ago before we even knew then about COVID. So. so let's talk a little bit about your publisher that you found. We, we dive into a lot of this stuff because, you know, we have had everybody from um, that self-publishes, hybrid, you know, publishers that have um, uh, publishers and authors. We've had people that unfortunately have gone through vanity presses, never go through a vanity press. Um, and we have authors that um, are just purely publishers. How did you find your publisher? Did your agent find them? How did, how did that happen? Yep. Um, it was through my agent. So I have a literary agent, um, Greg Johnson, uh, WordServe Literary. So it's part of uh, my background. So I, you know, was a preacher's kid. And um, so like my faith is one of the themes in my book. And so um, he represents um, authors who have that background, but um, pr uh, write about like national security and um, intelligence and that kind of thing. So again, with like the very specific niche um if how I do you find all these specific people this is <laughs> i have found every niche person along the publishing line <laughs> so he uh he found the imprint um and it, it still took some time like i had probably done it a little backwards for especially for nonfiction, where i actually wrote the full book and then wrote the proposal based on the book that i had already written and the reason for that is because I knew it was going to be hard to get cleared through the CIA, which and like Abe and I didn't expect how bad it was going to be. But, um, you know, I, I think that made it a little bit harder to find a publisher because um, it, it was already written. And normally you submit that proposal and then they have some input on how it's done. No, it's true. A lot of, a lot of publishers do want to, a lot of them also want to rewrite the book and tell you what story to tell, which can be thoroughly exciting, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I wanted to tell it in the way I wanted to tell it. Like this book, how it's written is like, that is 100% me. Um, it was how I wanted to tell it and the way I thought it should be done. And so, um, you know, the publisher ended up being uh, Post Hill Press. Um, and that's an imprint of Simon and & Schuster. Um, mm -hmm. And, the, you know, they did... Um, some sort of light editing apparently it's a problem with like former military and intelligence where we like weirdly capitalize things <laughs> so um <laughs> that was one of their comments to me yeah no i trust me it, i'm sure that's something that flew perfectly on cia reports not that i know that at all anybody who's watching this i know no cia um <laughs> so you do this. So what are the other things you're working on from a nonfiction standpoint? Uh, so from nonfiction, so I have a friend. Her name is Cindy, Cindy Otis, and she's also a former CIA. You might not know the whole network, but <laughs> we, I, we have I this whole, whole network. 
And we have a disclaimer. We have an underground network um, of you know former CA officers, and we sort of stay in touch. But um, she and I knew each other when we both worked there, and um, have stayed in touch. So her book just came out this year as well, um, True or False, and it's about like disinformation and and whatnot. So um, she and I have sort of similar backgrounds and similar interests. So um, we've talked about co-authoring a couple of books, and um, we've been working on the proposals for that. Um, and then I'm doing one on, so more like emergency preparedness, sort of, again, the crisis management side, like personal security, personal preparedness, and um, like very specifically want to do it like by women, for women. Um, so I work with a lot of first responders now, and then of course, former Intel, former law enforcement. So um you know, getting input from women from all these backgrounds on like what they would recommend to people. So um, those are the nonfiction ideas that I'm working on. Very cool. What about the fiction ideas? Because a little birdie named Rosa told me some <laughs> of them are children's books. Is that right? No, so I'm sort of gone back and forth on whether I wanted to do young adult or adult and um, I will admit this was one where my literary agent was like, we want spy novels. <laughs> we want spy novels with a strong female lead. We want <laughs> not just any spy. I'm like, I want a spy novel about a CIA officer who's a woman and an analyst. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I can do that. So you're writing yourself basically in fiction. It will be sort of semi autobiographical. Yeah. Oh, well, I figured as much. I mean, when you come from like Jen's a teacher, she wrote a book about teachers. Regardless of how she wrote it, it's semi-autobiographical no matter what she does. Well, right. Even if I was just going to write about, like, CIA operations in X country, like, I'd base it on what I know. So, you know, what else do you do other than just totally make it up? But if I'm going to write about my background. So, so you're, are you working on a spy novel now? Yep. I actually just submitted it to CIA for review. So we'll see. Fingers crossed. I hear back soon. Wow, that's going to be fun for you, having to submit all of your work to this. <laughs> right? That was the reason for sort of thinking maybe I'll do children's books, right? So I have another one that I wrote, so I don't know if we'll, I don't know if it'll get published or not, but sort of went sort of like young adult and more like science fiction because I figured that would be easier, and in fact, it was quite a lot easier to get approved. Oh, so, no, totally. I would think so. We'll so what is your writing process like? Oh, process. So I like to outline. I'm a big outliner. I have sticky notes of varying colors um, that I start with that and they're all over the wall. And um, sort of different color represents like character or um, chapter or plot or different things. And um, I will literally block out the entire book on the wall. <laughs> and um, then I will write an outline based on that so I can like move stuff around where I think like this like anecdote or this part of the story maybe it works better at the beginning than at the end um so I, I do all that visually and then I'll write it in an outline form in a word document and then um and then from there like do it like into chapters and so it'll be like chapter one and then like the main plot points I want to hit in that chapter and um, who's involved and then sort of go from there like each each one just build it out and I go through in um, I don't know, like waves I don't know if that's the right way of saying it but I go through multiple times so I'll, basically the first one is just plot like I will strongly focus on the plot and just get all of that hammered out and you know I mean you're still like talking about the characters and stuff but then I'll go through again and that like the second time I go through like I'll really focus on um, the characters and like building out like you know specific dialogue for each one and the way they look and like personality and that kind of stuff and then you know I'll go through again and do um, like the environment and like what's going on so really building out um, what things look like and feel like and taste like stuff like that so it's multiple times going all the way through Does that makes sense that's so interesting. I don't know that we've talked to anyone who, who does it like that. That's so cool. Oh, no, I don't know if it's, it's kind of weird, um, but I layer it. And then, you know, at the end, that's when I go through. And if anything needs to be taken out, that's sort of the last one where 
I sort of add and add and add and add them. And then at the end, if something doesn't work or it's unnecessary, then I go through and that's when I pull out. No, that makes sense. What are you doing, Jen? <laughs> I, have, I have stuff under my desk and it all just fell on my foot. So I'm off my foot. For those listening, not watching, you end up seeing all of a sudden Jen just fades from the view completely. And <laughs> like, I thought she was coming back and then she disappears again. And I'm like, oh. I had my foot on it and it just all went. <laughs> That's what I get okay. from my piles. So, okay, destruction time. Back to the outline. <laughs> no, I don't think I've talked to anybody who does it quite like that, but it's not weird. I don't think there's such a thing as a weird way an author goes about <laughs> doing like anything. Everyone has well, a different okay. process. Yeah, right. it's a process, you know? And some of us, like, I just learned, and it totally blew me away the other night, that George R. R. Martin is a pantser. Just... Like, mind blown, if you read the Game of Thrones series, I, I know, look at, Jen's face is like, what the actual crap? I had no idea, I, was, I thought he'd have a gigantic wall like you were describing, of all these things and strings linking all these characters, and how the hell do you pants a series like that? Anyway, new newfound respect for Mr. Martin, because I was like, what? As a pantser, I do that. So... When so, you wrote your the, the current book that's published, where were you when you did your sticky? Were you still, I'm guessing everything was over. You were out of Libya and then you went back and kind of looked it over? Yeah, so I, st so actually this probably goes back to what you were asking before too about why I started writing it. Um, so I actually started taking notes. So that one was a little bit different in that um, I started writing it while I was still working there. And I actually started it, um, just with notes in case I was called to testify before Congress. So I, I truly thought on the way out, like we were going to be ambushed or something horrific was going to happen and people were going to die. And like with every fiber of my being, I thought something was going to happen. Um, so I talked to um, one of my other chiefs who had been um, involved in a similar thing. And he recommended um, just taking notes in case I was called to testify because he was called, I want to say like, like a dozen times. Um, to talk um, before Congress about the thing he had been involved in. So I did, I started doing that, um, just, you know, very vague sort of records because I was gonna be carrying it with me on my way on the drive out. Um, so it was just sort of like dates and times and what was going on just so I could remember pretty specifically. And then, um, you know, got out, um, had some home leave and then got back to um, DC and was still working at um, headquarters and, you know, I, I knew pretty quickly that I wasn't going to be able to keep doing it. Like, I, I didn't feel like I was objective anymore as an analyst. Um, I had a lot of anger about what happened. Um, and so I decided, um, my mom actually has this advice. Like, if you go through a traumatic life event, wait a year before you make a major life-changing decision. Um, so I waited about a year and then um, knew I wanted to, but kind of gave it some time to make sure this is a big change, you know, like working for the CIA becomes such a part of your identity. <laughs> it's like, it's part of who you are. Um, so leaving was actually quite a big deal. And then um, when after, so there are different rules for review if you're currently a federal employee versus if you're a former. And so I knew I wasn't going to submit the book until um, I actually had resigned. That makes so, sense. Did so you... you went to school we're gonna go back going back in time scooby-doo i just scooby did that oh what were you gonna say jen you look like you're gonna actually ask a question I, I i did so you everything that you ever published has to go through uh, they have to read it at the cia so i'm just imagining that this person's job is to read all these books and then they're gonna read fiction spy thrillers is that common yeah yeah they have to read everything's so like any article you read by a former cia officer or anything like that um, we have to send it all in. So the only time you don't is if it's like completely unrelated to anything the CIA does. So actually, like I mentioned, now I do emergency management. And so I've written a couple of articles about like emergency management, like responding to the coronavirus or whatever. So like, I don't have to send something like that to the CIA because I, that has nothing to do with what I did there. Like if you wanted to write a romance novel, you wouldn't have to send that in. It depends on if 
the characters and stuff. The universe is spy and they're being romanced by somebody in Libya. Pay attention, Jen. There are rules. <laughs> It just seems like well, people got niche jobs. Like, what did you do today? Well, first I read about escaping Libya, and then after I read a lighthearted romance. Right? I bet you would do. That's a job I feel like I could pull off in the CIA, above anything else. <laughs> what is your job? I'm a CIA operative. What do you do? <laughs> I read books. spy novels. I, I read books. <laughs> <laughs> so neat. Oh, my goodness. You would how would you compare it. points of, never mind, I'm not going down that rabbit hole. Oh, well, I will say that process, so the review process is a nightmare in itself, right? So I've talked a lot about my own experience, but I will say that, um, like, I wrote articles where I was approved to say things that I was not allowed to say in the book. Um, people wrote reviews about my book where they were allowed to say things that I couldn't say in my book. So, like, the... Um, and again, like me taking, it took three years to get it finally done. Um, and other, like a director is going to be approved in like, you know, two weeks or something. Um, so that might be an exaggeration, but there's like, it's not consistent. There's no consistency in how they, um, review books. Um, like it shouldn't matter if I was a director or an analyst, right? Like the process should be the same for everyone and, if there are specific words or terms that you can't use, then nobody should be able to use them. But it's very, um, like, subjective and arbitrary and opaque and frustrating. Welcome to the publishing world. This book doesn't work, and I want you to change this entire thing. But the same the exact thing that I told you to change, the next author who submits, I'm like, cool. We'll let that fly. <laughs> it's lovely. Yay yeah. publishing. Yay. It's terrifying. Okay. We'll, we have to take a quick break. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back, and I'm going to do my Scooby-Doo going back in time. Nobody will interrupt me this time. We will be right back on Drinking With Authors. This is the voice of Drinking With Authors. You are at our commercial break, and our commercial is, hey, do you want to be a guest on our show? Or do you have a question for one of the guests on our show? Or do you have a brilliant drink recipe that we've never heard of? That would have to stump us. But you could reach us at drinkingwithauthors at gmail.com or on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. You can direct message or even just leave a comment on one of our posts. We would absolutely love to hear from you. And we're back. Okay. I'm literally... Um, we're using Zoom now in the time of COVID. And so it's super exciting because this is the second time we've recorded with it. I leave it to my producer. Okay, we were going to Scooby-Doo before Jen so rudely interrupted me previously with yes. real questions. Shut up. Nobody's interested in your opinion. Just kidding. Um, so you decided to study English, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go backwards. Did you ever write previous to, like, did you ever go, you know, I want to write previous to doing the CIA? Oh, um, not a book. So I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write children's books. That was really like specifically growing up. That's what I wanted to do. Um, but you know, it definitely changed as I got older. And then, um, so I actually interned when I was in college with emergency management and 9-11 happened. Um, that was my first um, activation where we um, went to the emergency operations center and um, helped get a search and rescue team ready to go to New York. So I think, you know, like for many, many people, it changed everything. Um, my, so I have three brothers and they all joined the military. And so like, I very much wanted to do something more like on the national or international level. And my boss at the time recommended defense intelligence agency, which really appealed to me because it's still defense. So sort of more in line with my brothers and what they were doing and like, strong military family, like half my, half my family is in the military, um, like aunts and uncles and cousins and all like both grandparents. And so, um, that, I mean, service is always really important in my family. I just thought I'd be writing about it instead of doing it. Um, <laughs> but here we are. So, but, so you go to school for English. I'm, I'm following the trip. We're, we're together on this little, little journey in time. 
and it's like the Willy Wonka boat. So we're going through the tunnel and we get to, now I'm going to be in CIA. How did, the, how did that evolution, you go to school for English, and but now you're a CIA agent. Now, I know how Rosa got there because Rosa wanted to be an X-Files agent. So <laughs> not that that's a real thing, not that the government would admit it if it was, but like going oh, down yeah. that path, that was like kind of the, the thought. X-Files part. for me was fringe. Like if CIA had a fringe office, I would have been in it. Um, I'd probably still be there. <laughs> um, never I found it. Knew if that was a possibility. Right? Um, so... Uh, I don't it's hard to describe like all the things that lead you on your journey, right? So I, like I said, I, I, I've always liked the survival type stories and like how people like overcome obstacles and like do more than they ever thought or dreamt they could do. And like, I've always liked that type of um, story and experience. And um, so I started doing stuff like I got my EMT certification while I was in college because I just thought, you know, like that would be an interesting thing to do. So, you know, like working on an ambulance, um, I thought I could do that while I was going to school. But then once I got that, then I heard about the emergency management position and, and ended up going with that one. So I think it's just all the different things that lead you down that path. Right. And then because I had that writer, well, right, because I had that um, EMT certification, I was working on emergency management, and they were looking for volunteers for search and rescue to help teach first aid to, like, the younger kids that were starting to go through. Not kids, there. I mean, they're all teenagers, kids, though. Um, so, you know, I, I started volunteering to do that, and, um, like, I was volunteering to do, um, like, rock climbing instruction with my church group, and so... Um, I was doing all these different things, and and then, like I said, it was just that 9-11 is such a defining moment. Um, I really... think almost every um, person that had um, uh, conscious memory kind of remembers where they were when that event happened for the U.S., you know? Yeah. I remember exactly where I was because I was driving to work when it yeah. came on the radio, and I was like, like, it seemed like everything just slowed down around me. And Jen's from New York. She actually, her family lives in New York, so. Yeah, I got a call, like, turn on the TV. What channel? Any channel. All right. Yeah. It was really early here, so I was actually still asleep, and my mom came, woke me up. She's like, you have to see this. And then, mm -hmm. um, you know, watching, and then I got the call from work, like, come in right now. Um I would assume you thought that call was coming within moments. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was already getting ready. Yeah. yeah. I knew I was going in. Um, so, when you, but it's, so you're doing this, was there ever a, I mean, you have a lot of perseverance to get through what you did to get this book out. Like, because there are many <laughs> times throughout your story that some people might have given up on what they were doing at that time. Yeah. Um, determination or stubbornness depends on you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to describe it. One got you through. I, I'm, I completely endorse either one of those situations. Yes. I've always been that way, though. Even from a little kid, like, very determined. Um, very strong-willed. Um, if I set my mind on something, I was going to do it. So well, when, uh, good. Well, go ahead, Jen. Sorry. When, when you say you, you always wanted to write children's books, do you mean, like, like young adult books or children's, like, yeah, children's young adult so what would you, how would you do a spy thriller young adult? Um, <laughs> this is the one that I have is, um, like, the girl, she's not a spy, she's a scout. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So you're just going to change it a little bit. Well, that, Jen, and she said she wanted to do sci-fi. We're going to talk about that after the show when we stop recording. But I'm going to have a oh, whole conversation <laughs> about sci-fi young adult and where to go with that because that's uh, it's so only sci-fi in that like there's no real places or names or locations in it right so I that's probably not the right word but and if you change it right. right so more like dystopian kind of post-apocalyptic kind of thing um Same thing. you're still all amazing yeah so I love them um, how long does it so when you sit down and write how many words can you get done in what you consider a day um, it just depends on how much time I have. So I kind of like to do it in chunks of time. 
So like if I'm going to do like one review all the way through, like I want to get it done as quickly as possible just to stay consistent. So like, like I talked about how I do it in the waves. I try to do each one in like a couple of weeks if I'm going to go all the way through it. Um, so I think the first draft of the spy novel, I want to say I did that like in, it was like two weeks. I got all the way through the first basically like getting out like the plot and everything built out that wasn't working so I that, like that's all I was doing I'm sorry but that's still like 80 hours and you're like I wrote the first draft of a, a spy novel <laughs> writers out there they're going I'm sorry what, what? <laughs> <laughs> well I only had I had a, a two hours to write how many words are you getting down I, I, it truly just depends on what's going on so for me, it works better if I have, a, like I said, a block of time. So like I knew when I wrote that first draft and it was the first time I did it, like, okay, I have this house alone to myself for the next two weeks. So I have to get it done. And so that's all I was doing. And, um, you know, there were still times like I wanted to like throw my laptop against the wall or something, but, um, you know, it helped to know that I only had until that time. So if I didn't get it done, then it wasn't going to get done. And I think it's harder when, for me, I work really good to a deadline. I've always been that way. Um, CIA just reinforced that like, strongly, right? Um, so I work better, work better under pressure and I work better when I have a deadline. So even if it's a self-imposed one, but if I knew like, like I have family coming to visit or whatever at the end of that two weeks, like I wasn't even be able to do it. So um, like I had that time. And so again, with the determination and all those other factors we already talked about, I'm like, okay, I either do it or I don't and you just go for it. So what is your writing environment like? Do you have music playing? Do you like being in coffee shops? We talked to somebody last week, me and Jen, that absolutely does not like writing in coffee shops. There's no benefit to it whatsoever. And I was, we were like, that's fascinating. So, um, cause we're both coffee shop writers. We can go write in any amount of noise. We just put our heads on and observe. So what do you like to write in? No, like, uh, environment like a hotel room or my room or like the house alone with nobody else around and no distractions. Um, so you won't put on music or anything? So I, I do sometimes, but I can't have words. It just has to be um, just music. So like when I was writing like the action scenes in these spy novels, I was listening to um, Rodrigo and Gabriella. So it's still like kind of intense kind of um, music, but there's no words to it. And so if I hear the words, I'll start singing along and then that's it. <laughs> We do, we do the same thing. Same thing. Journey, don't stop believing. We're screaming in. It has nothing to do with what we're writing, and it's over. Jen likes to put on playlists from YouTube for movies, yeah. like movie intense action playlists. Epic music. You can put in, like, eight hours of epic music, and then you'll just get, you know, or 20 minutes of epic music as someone has made a list. Yeah. No, I like no. the, um, gosh, not really just writing, but even outside, just remind me. Um, you can see, like, they have these, like, aquarium ones on YouTube where it's just, like, this beautiful aquarium with, like, this relaxing music in the background. I put those on all the time. I love them. I, the lo-fi girl is pretty big right now. The girl at the desk, and it's, like, a little gif, so the cat will move behind her, and it plays music. So there's, like, a bunch of different versions of the lo the lo-fi girl. Yeah. Doing, doing like homework or whatever. Wow. I have not even seen this. Go ahead, Jen. So Go. This, I just had this. All right. So my desk is a mess. I have piles. You can't, you could see them all behind me, but I'm like a super pile person. <laughs> all right. Does that bother you? Or you say you like, you're right in a hotel room. Are you like <laughs> laptop? That's it. If there's. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, those I take down as soon as I'm done. So, like, once I have it all plotted out, like, they come down. Do you keep um, them? Like, put them in a book somewhere, or do you throw them away? Actually, I probably still have some in this drawer right here. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, uh, no clutter. And, like, even if there's dishes in the sink that are dirty, like, they have to be clean before I can start writing. <laughs> like, wow. 
the house yeah, has to be clean. Yeah, I would never get any writing done if I had such parameters. We were just talking about how nice my room looks behind me nice. because when recording podcasts, apparently my boyfriend thinks I'm too loud when we're in the office, so he's resigned <laughs> me to this. But I was just showing Jen that, you know, my mess, I look all like beds. I don't make my bed, just general audience out there. I do for you guys, though, to make it look nice and pretty. <laughs> I feel like this is the three different like types of writer. Like you've got crazy clutter, and then Erica is like subdued but but professional, and then you're like, no, I just need a laptop. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So let's talk about reviews for a little bit on your book, right? So <laughs> you put your book out, you put your baby out there finally after so many years of trying to get it out. What has been the response for your book? It's actually been really incredibly nice for the most part. So I've had I've had a handful of people who were involved in the response to Libya in some way that like helped with the evacuation that I had no idea about that I'd never heard about. And they've reached out to say like, you know, this is what I was doing while you were evacuating. Um, you know, thank you for writing this book. Um, just incredible. Like, it's so humbling to get those messages from other people where they've talked about, like, how much they sacrificed to try to help me and to have them reach out and share that. Like, that's it's very moving and very humbling. Um, I've had a couple reviews, like, in um, Fox News and a couple other things, and they've been incredibly nice. <laughs> like loved the book and um the reviews were really good amazon is like i try not to look at the reviews on there um i think it's still like four and a half stars so that's still good but of course like i'm sure like every author's focus on the bad ones right <laughs> and well, we talk a little bit about that on here because i think it's important as an author i mean you can decide just to ignore reviews if you're going to decide to ignore reviews totally fine i don't think there's anything wrong with just ignoring the reviews period right but if you're going to look at negative reviews you have to take a step back because we you can't take it personally like the internet is i talk about this review i've talked about it a lot on this show where a friend of mine found this yelp review and it said the food was amazing the waitress was awesome the drinks were good. My Moscow Mule's lime was not as fresh as it could be. One star. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That, it literally was a one star review saying how great everything was. Had pictures, <laughs> Except the lime. <laughs> but the lime on the Moscow Mule was not as fresh as it could be. And it, But it just shows you, like, if you're going to look at the negative reviews, you have to go... I'm literally looking for that nugget of gold where they say that I've got incorrect tenses that my grammar was like you look for very specific i feel like editorial points to go okay i need to not do that again but yeah, so it, there there wasn't any of that i think there's one one star review and it was clearly written by somebody who was at the embassy and i was really pretty critical in my book of the state department and um their response and what they did and so it was clearly written by um, one of them. <laughs> like, well, you know, super obvious. Things, they took the time. Uh, this is what I always say when people say something about a book. I go, thank you for purchasing my book. Right. <laughs> like, you, you gave me money. Thank you for giving me money. I appreciate that. That actually just funds me to continue to do what you're not <laughs> happy with me doing. I'm not sure they actually bought it because um, the, the criticism ultimately in the end was like how much, like I just made it all about me and I took credit for everything. And I said, like, I was responsible for getting everybody safe. I'm like, actually in the book, if you read it, I go out of my way to say like how much other people were helping and how cool it was like that year I got back. Like the last chapter sort of ends with like finding, like I'm so glad I stayed because I found out like how much people were doing during the evacuation to try to like watch us and like make sure like we were okay and like all the stuff they had prepared and staged in case something happened. And like I said, like that is, it was just so moving. And so that's how I ended the book is like finding out about all of that, which is so cool. No, totally. 
you have a group of um I do know about this super agent um talk chatter chatter <laughs> channel I call it the Chatter Channel. I'm gonna call Rosa and tell her I've just renamed it to the Chatter Channel. And I, uh, we call it we call it Spy Gals. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> she tells me, um, but she didn't tell me what you guys say. She just says I talk to my Spy Gals. So just again reiterating, do not bother coming to talk to me. I know nothing useful. <laughs> so, um, when you are a bunch of you guys have written books, so or are writing books. Have you guys created kind of a writer's community? Um, not formally, no. Um, and some of the people who are in our chat are not writers, so, um, it's okay. We still like all former spy women. <laughs> um, you don't have to write books. Uh, no, not, not formally. Like we've, I mentioned, um, like with Cindy, um, you know, we've talked about maybe trying to write some books together and in fact, have started working on some proposals. So, um, you know, I just, um, it's it's informal and 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 we talk to men too um so i actually like david priest who's written um a couple of books now he's been like phenomenal mentor to me like he was the one that um like i was first put in touch with after getting out like i didn't know where to start with the whole process and so like he really um helped me along the way and and you know truly appreciate everything that he's done and um there's a couple other, like Fred Burton, um, he was State Department and he's written a few books and um, reached out to him pretty early on because he actually wrote one about Benghazi. And so, you know, talked to him about mine and like, it's about what happened after. And so there, I mean, it's informal, but I think we all have a tendency to um, be more open to chatting with um other former intelligence or whatever. And, and it's usually we are, we're put in touch through somebody else. So, um, there, there is a, <laughs> there, truly there's a vetting process as well. There's a, you have to make it to the members only jacket club or you're not in. Well, you know, like people will lie about being in and it's for us, it's usually pretty easy to tell. Um, but usually, um, it's word of mouth, like recommendation from a mutual friend or something like that. Totally. So let's talk a little bit about the editing process for you. So did you have the book edited at all before you submitted it to um, everybody that you ended up submitting it to before you got to your publisher? Did you? No, just, just me. Um, I actually have my copy editing certification as well. So um I'm, I don't like editing. I don't know if anybody, well, I don't think writers enjoy editing, but it, it was um, important to me um, to get it. You what? I like yeah. editing an editor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there's, there's the one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no I, I, it's interesting when writers try to edit their own work. I mean, if you're a copy editor in that work, well, I think that's a, a gem amongst normal people because for me I've gotten to the point as a writer I think the editing process is important if you understand the fundamentals of the editing and you have a correct editor because their job depending on what they're you know if it's story editing their job is to have an outside view and take a look at your story and go this is what what, what story are you trying to tell because this is what is being visible because a lot of times we read it and you know the story like your entire thing was based on a story you were a part of and you were in seeing it on paper is not necessarily what people see and then there's the fact that like for instance you know my last book I put out I possibly changed a character's name in two chapters I possibly there was a John slash Noah person and they were the same person that possibly happened maybe <laughs> <laughs> And so for me, I look at the editing to go, somebody it needs to make me look good. Like that's how I look at editing because I have these great ideas, but maybe, maybe they're not, maybe John and Noah maybe need to be the same person in the story. See, yeah. I, just, I need another pair of eyes because I, after you're looking at it for so long, I start to see what I think is there and not what's there. Like I can edit other people's work, but my own, I don't. I send it to other people to be my brain. I send it to other people for, I guess, more like plot and character um, input. Um, but I don't, don't even, 
I don't know any other people who specialize in editing, so I usually just do it myself. But um, even when the publisher was editing, it wasn't, there wasn't anything like really heavy with the edits on like, like this character is totally wrong or whatever. It was really just um, like, for example, I talked about a go bag and he was like, what's a go bag? <laughs> like, you know, there needs to be something about where for me with where I'm coming from, like a, so obvious what it is um, that I didn't even think to put in an explanation. Um, and then, you know, most of my readers are also similar, like military intel. So like everybody was like, Let's go bag. <laughs> Um, we all know what that is. Please and thank you. <laughs> so stuff like that. Um, and then actually my mom is the best person I know for catching typos. Like she just has an eye for it. Um, and I don't think everybody does. Like I'll read a word. Like I, I'm one of those, I can read one of those like things and like all the vowels are gone. I can still read it kind of thing. So like, I'll just skip right over typos. I don't even notice. And um, she's like the queen of catching typos. So we did have mom, the editor then during the process. <laughs> oh yeah. But even then, like I can't send it to anybody until after CIA has approved it. Right. So um, that's also kind of nerve wracking. Really, like, You write a whole book and you can't get any feedback or like friends like talking about like is this good is this bad or like should I change like before anybody else sees it you have to send it to the CIA well that definitely changes the whole concept of beta readers doesn't it <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my beta readers are the CIA thank you <laughs> um and I can tell you it's not classified <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, because we have to wrap up, let's get a little advice from you for authors out there. What advice would you give young authors out there? Uh, don't join the CIA and write books because the process of getting them reviewed is a nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't join the CIA, I love that. <laughs> no, I, I, in all seriousness, like, I will never regret my time in the CIA. I loved it. I'm glad I did it. Zero regrets about working there. Zero regrets about leaving. I'm um, glad I left. But as far as writing, I would just stick with it. Like it's a process and it takes a long time. And, um, you know, like mine from the time I wrote it until the time it was published is like six years. And um, it's, it's just a process and it's going to take a while and to stick with it. Awesome. So what is the next book coming out for you? I don't know. I just submitted it to CIA for review. So it is 100% dependent on like if they're going to take a year and a half or a month. And who knows? What is the name of it when it does come out, do you think? Well, my name right now, the working title is Shadow Base. Very, very cool. And then how do people find you? This is a shameless self promotion. No, no, no I like it. Readers <laughs> to find you. So I have a website. Um, my name is super common. It's Sarah Carlson. So I had to go with my middle initial as well. So it's um, www.sarahmcarlson.com. And um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So there's links to all that on the website. Awesome. Awesome. You have been wonderful. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Okay, so I have the, this has been drinking, wow, I have had ginger whiskey. This has been Drinking <laughs> with Authors. I'm Erica Lance. Jay and Paquette. And we'll see you next time. Spend all your time waiting for that second chance for a break that would make always some reason to feel not good enough and it's hard at the end of the day I need some distraction oh beautiful release memory seep from my veins let me be empty some peace tonight in the arms of the angel fly away
CEO of Four Horsemen Publications. Oh, and a host of Drinking With Authors. Are you a frustrated author? Is writing hard? Are you not getting the words out? We have the solution for you. The Author's Accountability Guide 2021. In it contains accountability, four muses, practice exercises. We even have an online community where you and your fellow writers can figure out what the heck you're doing wrong and how to fix it. Everything you need is contained in this book. I'm not only a sponsor, I'm also a writer. Find us at the Author's Accountability Guide because I know you're wondering how to make writing less hard. That you make up for all that you lack It don't make no difference Escape one last time It's easier to believe In this sweet madness All this glorious sadness That brings me to episode okay this drinking with authors literary briefs which means we're wearing only our underwear just kidding that's not true <laughs> um so i'm your host erica lance with me today is jm paquette and our guest today is sarah carlson yay okay <laughs> hi let's talk a little bit about what we're drinking because i like talking about what i'm drinking um in our drinking with authors mug that you can win these things okay so i am drinking still um apple cider with uh ginger whiskey it maybe was not, um, maybe it was equal portions, just FYI, because I'm feeling pretty awesome right now. <laughs> I'm drinking coffee in my Drinking With Authors mug, but it is Bananas Foster flavored coffee, so it's fancy coffee. Not really. I am sorry. Okay, Sarah, what are you drinking? All right, so I brought the bottle so you can see. This is my <gasps> favorite wine. It's bread and butter, Pinot Noir. Oh. And it's amazing. Oh, God. Um, so that's what I have. Cheers. I like that you have it in a mason jar. <laughs> um, yeah, I, okay. <laughs> this is all I own. Oh, my gosh. I know. I um, I love wine glasses. I think they're beautiful. I will drink in them if I am out. They are so easy to break <laughs> that I just stick with the mason jar. Yes, we're going to send you drinking with authors because Jen will show they come with a lid. So nice. <laughs> for, for grown adults, we can, yeah, no, it's true. That's why I was like, when I was getting cups, I was like, you know what we need to do is get solo cups. And it's hot or cold. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. Anyway. Okay. So literary, okay. Literary briefs, rapid fire questions. The first question for you, what is your favorite book of all time? Oh my gosh. This isn't going to be very rapid. I'm going to be like, oh God, I have to pick one. That's okay. You'll ask me and I forget what question I'm on by like question. Oh, okay. I love, okay. I, this is probably, uh, anyway, 1984 by George Orwell. I've always I loved love that. I've read it probably half a dozen times. Um, love that book. My copy is like old and tattered and clearly well loved. <laughs> What do you love most about that book? Because it's um, actually kind of a scary book if you look at it, like that society oh, is. where it ends up. Well, I, I think as we've talked about already, I love dystopian books, any kind. I like survival stories. I like dystopian. I like looking at how people survive in these like extreme situations. And so um, what I like about that book is um, how he like slowly realizes and um, comes to terms with like his life and that it's not what he wants and then tries to break out of that and ultimately is not successful but yeah it is actually a deeply disturbing book but I think most dystopian books are. No true accurate okay what is your least favorite book of all time? Okay I know I should love it Pride and Prejudice I've never <laughs> been able to get through it never. <laughs> Erica agrees with you. Yeah, uh, I like the movie. Jane Austen. Oh my love, God. Love the movie. Cannot get through those books. Um, like the descriptions of the things. 
are so detailed and I'm just like, okay, just skip ahead to the dialogue. <laughs> um, and it's just not my style and, um, and I find it um, very difficult to get through. So I have actually never completely read Pride and Prejudice. Well, if you read Pride, Prejudice, and Zombies, <laughs> which I have read, you can get through it because there are zombies and they, <laughs> them and they have to fight them. No, I agree. Nobody gives a flying crap about the damn needlepoint. Move on. Yeah, no, that's it's... all she had to talk about. I, I, I can appreciate why other people love it, truly, but I cannot get through it. It's just that it was like, super detailed descriptions of things. And honestly, like even um, is it Tom Clancy's books, it's about different things, but he does the same thing as Jane Austen. Like he goes into like this hyper detail about nuclear fission, you know, like it's nobody just cares. not my thing. <laughs> totally. Go Sorry, rapid Tom Clancy. Fire, Jack. <laughs> Sorry, Jack Ryan. Love you. Of, of rapid <laughs> fire. Are you a paper book reader or an ebook reader? Paper. I will do ebooks when I'm traveling. Um, I have quite a few on my Kindle as well. I have a lot of copies of books that are on my Kindle and paper. Um, if I really like one, I'll just get both. But um, yeah, I prefer paper. So follow up, will you write in a book? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have. Keep it pretty. No, nonfiction usually. So I won't normally write in my fiction books. I don't, I don't know why there's a clear distinction there, but um, I will, um, I guess not so much write words, but I'll like highlight through um, some of the nonfiction books I really like. Um, so um, there's been a few actually that I might as well make a plug for, right? If that's okay. Um, no, plug, plug away. So if you like nonfiction and you like survival type stories and you're interested in that kind of thing, like there's this um, author, Lawrence Gonzalez, and he's written um, Deep Survival, and it's about, like, how we how we survive and, like, the process that the brain grow, goes through and um, why we make decisions we do um, in crisis. Absolutely adore that book. And he wrote a follow-up called Surviving Survival. And I wish I had had that book, like, the day after I got back from Libya. Like, I went through so much, like, PTSD and, like, trying to process what happened, to anybody who's gone through anything traumatic, I um, strongly, strongly recommend that book. It helped me so much. No, totally. Absolutely. I don't know if I want to know how I think about things. I think that would terrify me to actually figure out how my brain <laughs> is working because I don't trust my brain. Well, it, honestly, it helped to, to know like the PTSD, like the, the way the brain does it and how like you... The, the way the neurons fire, like it makes that permanent association with things. So like I can know in my brain, like it's fireworks and not a bomb, but I hear it and I like, I want to dive under this table, you know? Um, and it's not logical. And that, that bothers me because I'm a very, like, again, like very logical. Um, it's, I, I do HR for my day job, not drinking. Cause you're not allowed to apparently, but, um, one of the things, like, we have poppers at work to celebrate things. And when I got there, this was just part of the culture. They did poppers, and I had to go tell the CEO, I'm like, as much as it's cool to have poppers, we have to go, hey, we're going to have poppers, because anybody who's ex-military or ex-agency and stuff, they sound like grenades and stuff going off when they, they, they explode. And I'm like, we have to tell them so that they can clear the area so they're not triggered by us doing that and you know it's it's an i call it an invisible trait it is an, an invisible trait that you don't necessarily see on somebody but you have to pay attention to but that is, that is fascinating that um he's mapped that because it it it's definitely no it's true oh that got very serious for a second that's okay no but anybody who's been through anything traumatic i strongly recommend it i wish i'd had it it really for me, because logic is important, it helped me understand the logical process of why it happens. No, totally. Okay, will you, this is one of my favorite questions. So Jen has a happy ending fetish. Um, so it's maybe not a fetish. Maybe that's not the right word. It's fine, though, because <laughs> got a lot of uh, ginger whiskey now. So fetish it is. 
this. Um, <laughs> she will look at this. She got kind of traumatized by a book at one point in time where they killed this lead character. Like, as you can see from the look on her face, if you're watching us on YouTube, she's heavily traumatized. So now every time she picks up a book, she looks to see if the character is still on the last page of the book. <laughs> she won't read it if the character is gone from the book because she's so traumatized. Would, um, do you require a happy ending? And, and there can be multiple answers to that question of what a happy ending is, depending on what kind of fiction you want to read. But um, do you need a happy ending to your books? When no. You no. I, in fact, most of them are like sad ones. Although, your story reminds me, I'm totally going to do a spoiler because it's a really old book. And if you don't know, if you haven't read the book, you're not ever going to read it, right? So Last of the Mohicans. Um, that book ends very differently than the movie. And so I saw the movie when it first came out. I was like 13. And I loved it so much. I wanted to read the book. So I got the book and I came out like sobbing. <laughs> we just absolutely <clears throat> that gut wrenching book, sobbing. That book is the reason why Mark Twain started writing fiction. He was like, if this James Fenimore Cooper guy can write a book like Last of the Mohicans, which logically makes zero sense, it's sad at the end what happens. But the whole plot of the book is ridiculous. You're like, okay, so you can sneak into a fort. It's a huge deal. And then two days later, you can leave with a dude singing at the top of his lungs and nobody shoots at you. Okay, there's zero <laughs> logic happening in this story. But it is, the, the ending of it is sad. I did the same thing. I watched the movie and then I went back and read the book. And then I, English degree, so you learn all the background. And Mark Twain is a contemporary of Cooper. And he was like, if this Joker is popular, then I can be popular. And he wrote, you know, that's how we ended up with uh, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn and all that's that. That's awesome. I didn't know that. I just, <laughs> that the wrong people die. <laughs> it was really traumatic to me. Yeah. Well, good. Like my horror stories, because not a single one of them has a happy ending ever. <laughs> love so much. I'm, I'm fine with not writing a happy ending. Um, some, I've, some of my mom has gotten after me and she's like, just don't write as everybody dies. I'm like, okay, mom. Um, but I'm also not opposed to for that book. Just <laughs> I, I'm also not opposed to flipping to the end. Like I don't do it all the time, but sometimes I'll flip to the end and There's see if they're still alive. <laughs> yeah. I've had too many tragic books in my life. I want to read happy stories. I want everybody <laughs> to live. But I won't read a John Green novel. Well, Will you put a book down, Sarah? So this is another thing is Jen only recently has somehow acquired the skill set to put a book down when it's fucking terrible. Because I will, I'm done, done. I will not continue reading it. That's my gesture for my Kindle in case anybody was wondering what that gesture is. <laughs> because I do like paper books, but they, I don't have a library. They, I end up giving my paper books to other people to read if they're good books and stuff or donating them. But I have a lot on Kindle, but I won't, I, like, I'll get to a certain point and I'm like, I'm done. If it doesn't grab me, if I'm not enjoying it, or the writer does something just, like, throws me out of the story enough times, bad editing, like, I can't do it. I will not persevere and finish the book. Will you finish the book? No, no. I give it usually three chapters. If it hasn't grabbed me and I don't care how it ends, then I don't bother. Yeah, I have zero problem putting a book down. Let it go. Okay, like I, there's a lot of books in the world, and I don't have a lot of time, so gotta gotta be picky. What were you gonna ask, Jen? You had that I, gonna, I finally learned that ability, but it took me a long time. I was like, well, <laughs> this person put a lot of time and effort into it, so I should give them my attention. And yeah, I'm now, also yeah. I, I'm a rereader, so books I really love, I've read half a dozen times, maybe more. Like, I will reread a book I love over and over again. Oh, what are you reading right now? Right now? Oh, gosh, I can't remember the name. I just got it on Amazon. I'm totally blinking right now. Sorry. Will um, you read more than one book at a time? No, I usually just stick with one. I can't do it. If I do that, I, I literally... So I had this problem happen with watching a TV show recently, which was Vikings and The Last Kingdom, I think it is called, on net. One of them's on Amazon. The other one's... Is it Last Kingdom? 
um, on Netflix, they're the same story, basically, right? They're about the Vikings invading England and Ireland and stuff. And so I'd watched them, like, I'll, I binge-watched them, and I was watching The Last Kingdom, is it The Last Kingdom? Last Kingdom. And I'm sitting there, and I couldn't understand what was happening at all on the TV show, because I'm like, wait. And then I kept looking, and I'm like, no, nope, no, nope, that was the other one. And I finally had to just stop thinking about what happened in the previous seasons because I was like, I don't understand what, okay, I'm just going to go with what's happening. Didn't we already do this? <laughs> Didn't we already invade this particular castle? I thought we already did this. And that... I was like, that was Vikings. And I'm like, okay, but who are these? Okay, I don't care who these, I'm just going to sit here and watch this. <laughs> eat some popcorn because I don't understand anything that's happening. The same thing happens to me in books though is if I'm reading books especially if I'm reading same genre books like about paranormal romance or something. Too similar. Yeah. They're too similar and there's demons in one and vampires but is there wait wait, didn't she (laughs) okay. I thought the vampire got her. (laughs) Yes. How did that happen? Okay you have any guilty pleasures in reading? Oh yeah romance novels. I, I did look up um, the book. Sorry, I just have to say. Um, Charlie Holmberg, I don't know if you've read any of her books. She's like the paper magician, and she just had a new one come out that was one of the oh, yeah. prime books for October. So I got that one and just started it. But I really like the paper magician series. But yeah, um, Guilty Pleasure. I love Julie Garwood's um, historic romance novels. I've read them all many times. Only the historic ones. Um I've tried her modern ones. I don't care for them as much. And I've read them over and over and over and over. So if Jane Austen had taken all of the ridiculous detail out, you would have been on board with that situation. (laughs) But I wouldn't tell anybody, except for you now and everybody listening. (laughs) I don't normally tell people. Yeah, it's now recorded. So it's it's done. It's done. (laughs) Do you listen to books on audio or, or just straight read? I used to. I don't anymore. Um, when I was in D.C. and had that hellacious commute every day, I would be listening to audiobooks. So that was really during the commute is when I would do it. But especially now, working from home, I'm not. So this topic came up. I'm going to jump in and then you can ask your question. I actually got interviewed for my day job for an article because Microsoft Teams is coming out with uh, some new program where it's supposed to get you set up to start your day and a way to unwind from your day. And they asked me to comment and I was like, who the hell would want to be anywhere near a computer more than they have to be already? Because we're all in a position where even if we had computers and we had to use them, we're now, this is our entire world. Because even having meetings, we're in the computer. We're doing, I say this on a Zoom. But um, one of the things I started recommending for our employees is Go walking and go listen to the audiobooks that you used to listen to or the podcasts you used to listen to. So if a podcast an hour, wake up in the morning, go for a walk for an hour and listen to your podcast or listen to an hour of your book and do the same thing in the evening so you can have still that time outside of the house away from the computer to, you know, de-stress or get yeah. energized for your day. Yeah, that's because- a good idea. Yeah, we, it it was easy because Jen had a a, a commute. I had a commute listening to, um, I actually re-listened to a lot of my own podcasts because I drink a lot in these and I don't know what I say. So it's good (laughs) to go back just in case I'm ever, you know, called on it. Um, (laughs) But I was like, this is something I think is important for us all to do to not get up and just go right to the computer almost. And then be on the computer and a lot of our, as writers and stuff, this is our world anyway. Like we're on the computer again. So have a time where you get up, mask on or off, depending on where you're walking and go for a walk and take that time for yourself that you took for yourself normally on a commute just because you had to do it. That is yeah. Erica's drunk advice for the day. Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> That's pretty good advice. We, um, unfortunately, I live in Seattle area and um it started raining last night and it's probably not going to stop until may (laughs) so (laughs) i had to figure out a different way than walking but maybe see i can go outside in seattle and be fine (laughs) the oh jen is allergic to sunlight as well Mm -hmm. just for the record jen is actually a vampire with none of the bonuses 
Yes. None of the bonuses. She's allergic to sunlight, so Seattle would be her thing. But I think getting a cute pair of galoshes and a nice... Uh, right. It didn't pretty- bother me growing up here. Like, I was used to it. And then I moved away, and I spent a lot of time in the desert and um, other places. And now coming back, and I'm like, it rains all the time. So what People are like, Seattle's so beautiful. And I'm like, kind of like England. England's very beautiful, except when it's raining. 70 percent of the time (laughs) i have a friend that lives up in um uh, near leeds and beautiful old 1800s farmhouse that they because they have historic buildings there you know and he's redoing the whole farmhouse and he sends pictures and i'm like that is really pretty and he goes yeah only come between these months because otherwise you're going to be stuck in our farmhouse in the rain yeah your family in florida i'm like just come in august don't even bother any other month. Just stick with August. Yes, yeah, so true. So Jen, question. I was going to say, how has COVID affected your writing? Oh, um, so in emergency management, um, I, most of what I'm doing right now is COVID. So I haven't been writing a book lately um, because I've been editing the one I just submitted. Um, and I'll be working on the proposal but like I'm writing about coronavirus every day. Um, So I've written a few articles um, about like how to be prepared and like, you know, things to consider um, in the middle of coronavirus. So I'm still writing about, I'm still writing. It's just writing about it instead of something else. But that is also like my area of expertise. So that's the bulk of what I'm doing. So you get to write about what we're all experiencing. Well, I have to do it for my job, and so it's kind of hard to make myself do it in my free time as well, but, um, you know, I think it's important information, so, um, and it's something I know well, so I've just, like, picked a couple times, again, with, like, the restriction on time, so, like, I'll give myself, like, okay, I'm going to do it, like, Saturday morning, like, this podcast, right, like, I'm going to have, like, two hours, and those are the two hours I have to get it done, and if I don't get it done, then I don't get it done. So it helps to give myself those kind of deadlines. No, that's true. I think a lot of authors that we've talked to, as much as we all thought, you know, in our, I can say, dystopian view of how it would be if we were all confined to our house and we'd get so much more writing done and we'd be like these epic authors that, and that doesn't happen. No, well, there's so much else going on, like kids not in school and trying to do like homeschooling while also trying to work from home and then like the book has come out so like doing podcasts and stuff like that you know it's all it's really just about fitting stuff in when you can (laughs) so it's what do you feel like as an author are your um uh little things that you do like obviously I change the names of characters in books this is my new thing that I apparently do I didn't do it previously previously everybody realized things but I've graduated from people realizing things to changing the names of characters throughout my book what do you consider your little like you know bad habits or stuff as a writer um so I don't decide what the chapters are until I've written it so I'll write it all as one long document and then I'll go back and divide it into chapters and then fill out the chapter. So that's probably a little weird. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Have you ever heard that, Jen? No, that's cool. No, don't get ideas. That's not necessarily (laughs) cool. Well, I mean, I think when you're writing, it helps to be like, okay, I'm going to write chapter one today and, um, and just do that. But I, I found for me, like when I'm writing to an end point, like you're writing to a close of a chapter. And I think, whereas if I write it as like a single narrative and then go back in and decide where the natural ending is, I think it often works better. Oh, it's a very interesting concept. And also I could see like, cause you're telling the whole story and you're not stopping and starting again. And I think it depends on whether or not you are jumping from POV, from point of view to point of view. I think sometimes chopping up a chapter helps with, like, if you're going from, like, the lead a person's character to their love interest and they go back and forth, like, there's, you know, like, Sherilyn Kenyon, every chapter is the opposite person's point of view on what's happening. It would be hard to write that fluidly, but I could see if it's the same POV the whole entire time, right? 
Yeah, and instead of aiming for the end of the scene or the end of the chapter, you're aiming for the end of the book. So it makes it almost easier to keep going. That's a good motivational tool, technique. I like that. As Jen changes her writing techniques after that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't write chapters, I write scenes. So my chapters are uneven. They're never the same length. And I know for some people that's a big issue. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, one thing I realized was, so I'm listening to Haunting of Hill House because another um, person that is, uh, works with us and is in our, um, does podcast sometimes, her name's Vanessa, and she's like, I want to do scary books. She apparently doesn't read scary books, but she's like, I'm going to read scary books. And so she wanted to do The Haunting of Hill House. And I said, okay, I'll listen to it with you. Um, and uh, I started listening to it, and I realized that most horror books do not have chapter names. Did you know they just go chapter one? To, I didn't know that. Like, I never noticed it, I should say. What? It would ruin it. I if you titled a horror, it would be like, in the kitchen, in the attic, under the bed. Like, it would ruin what's going to happen that <laughs> chapter. I wouldn't say the monster's under the quilt. Like, you don't say that. No, but it's still... The part of what makes horror work is that you don't know what's going to happen. So if you title your chapters, then we know what's going to happen. Fine, whatever logic, use logic. <laughs> I'm just saying I realized this. Admitting a realization, Jen. It's good. That's not helpful. Okay, so we're coming to the close of our literary briefs episode. Now that Jen just fought with me on that and changed <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever. Okay, so um, your next book is being um, reviewed by the CIA as we speak. Something that no other author we've ever had on this podcast <laughs> it's so and it's uh tell us a little bit about it so it's a f without giving away anything the cia says you can't talk about it, but it's a female spy novel with a lead um well female nice spy. okay words so my lead spy yes. novel what can you say about it so the, the setting is in the middle east it's on a forward operating base it alternates POV between the female spy and um, the male um, special ops character. Um, there may or may not be a love interest. Um, and there has to be. There has to be. <laughs> and um, they have to stop an attack before, um, before it's too late. Very cool. I'm super excited whenever the CIA releases that and we know when it's going to be published. But people can find that out by looking you up and following you on... My website. Um, I am at www.sarahmcarlson.com. The M is important because my name's super common. Um, and you can get my current book right now. It's out. It's called In the Dark of War. Very cool, and it's available on all of the sites and Amazon. You guys can always follow her on Amazon as well, and then that way you know when all of her new stuff is coming in. <laughs> Amazon or Goodreads, any of that, yep. Awesome, awesome. Well, you have been absolutely delightful. I have learned many things today. Jen, do you feel <laughs> educated today? Definitely, this was really cool. Very cool. So thank you so much for being on the podcast with yeah. us. Thank you for having me on, this is fun. Absolutely. Okay, so this has been Drinking with Authors, Literary Briefs. I've been your host, Gary Pickens. Yeah, I'm Paquette. And we will see you next time.